Tonight's CLE is developing a startup business plan for the new law practice. And I'd like to give a special thank you to the Florida Bar who helped um, arrange the CLE tonight. They put together our speakers, particularly the Loma section um, is the section from the Florida Bar that we're working with tonight. And with us this evening, we have um, Lisa Dasher and uh, Daniel Perry. And I'd like to give a special thank you to Mr. Perry who's um, visiting us from Orlando. So I'd now like to um, turn it over to our speakers and thank them once again for being here. Oh, I don't need that. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa Dasher. I work at the law firm of Wicker Smith, O'Hara, McCoy, and Ford in Miami, Florida. And for those of you who don't know, we're a statewide law firm. We have over 140 lawyers, and I've been at the firm for over 30 years. And I know I look really good for my age, okay? Um, I am a certified public accountant. I am the firm's CFO. I have been the executive director and CFO for going on 17 or 18 years now. So I have a lot of experience in the financial aspects of the firm and how we run our business. And hopefully we can translate that into an educational experience for you. Um, financial forecasting, why is it necessary? If you're looking to go out and start up your own business, your own law firm, it's important that you want to sit down and figure out how the financial forecast impacts your future. First is your formulation of your business plan, and for many of you, this may entail going out to a bank to seek financing, going to a family member and saying, I'm looking to start up my own law practice. I need, can you help? What can you do for me? Um, second for forecasting your financial future is actually to sit down and plan your future. If you don't want to seek a loan or investment, you may want to figure out how much money you need to um, continue your business going forward. Um, we're going to sit down and talk about the different financial statements and we're also going to talk about the business plan and we are going to touch on a little bit of technology in the area of finance, but not much. The financial statements in your business plan, if you're going to a bank to seek financing, are an integral part of that business plan. You're going to need those. They're at the end of your business plan. You know, you sit down and think, what are you going to show to the banker that you're going to sit with? But they're all the way at the end. But they're the most key piece for that banker to evaluate whether your business is viable. So it's important you really understand what's going on there. Um, financial forecasting is very difficult. In the economy we're in, in the climate, with everything happening and changing rapidly, you have to be cognizant of what you can do and what you can accomplish. As an owner, it's important for you to understand those financial statements. Um, the business owner has to have the talent of not only just practicing law. A lot of the lawyers in my firm come to work every day and because they're at a big firm, they don't ever have to worry about where that money is coming from, how they're making it, who's sending the bills out, because we have a staff to do that for them. But if you're looking to start out on your own, that's going to be your responsibility. It's going to be key for you to understand how it works. The financial statements um, are going to track actual events. You're going to see what happens. You're going to track going forward and how you can compare those events to everyday things that happen. You're going to be looking at the financial statements to determine can you make adjustments? You know, Do you really need to go out and take um, a client to dinner this month? Do you have the money to do it? You know, What are your budgets? In your financial plan, you're going to sit down and learn about project and performance objectives. So you're going to take your numbers and start looking at them and project out, not just a month, not just two months, but look out a whole year and figure out where you're going to be. And I know it sounds like a daunting task, but you have to plan for your future. And you have to document and control what's going in your business plan so that you know um, what's going to happen there. The pro forma financial statements that are in your business plan are pretty simple. Probably everybody in this room knows you're going to have an income statement, a balance sheet, and an operating or cash budget. And those things are really going to drive how you run your business. 
the income statement's going to set out your sales projections or your revenues, calculate your expenses, and forecast your profit. Remember that just because you have a profit on a piece of paper doesn't mean you have cash in the bank to pay yourself. So your balance sheet contains your assets, your liabilities, and your equity. And your cash or operating budget is going to actually forecast your cash flows. So an accurate budget is going to make or break your business plan. It's really a key to know how much cash you're going to have on a monthly basis. There's one more financial statement that's not going to be in a business plan, but if you're working on your own business every month, and that is a cash flow statement. We're not going to talk about it much, but it's, it actually outlines where your cash goes. One of the things people don't understand is just because you made that profit on paper, why don't you have cash? And a cash flow statement will explain where your cash went. You know, did you buy assets? Did you pay down debt? Um, what happened to the actual cash? So when you're sitting here working on your pro, form, pro forma financial statements, there's some key pieces you need to plan for and know and understand, and that is your projected revenue, your startup expenses, your operating expenses, and then your cash requirements. And projected revenue, you think, how am I going to figure it out? We're gonna t I'm going to show you a spreadsheet that I have that actually lays out how those numbers work and how you can sit down and figure out um, how you can come up with your projected revenue. Startup expenses are fairly easy. We'll go through and talk about how, what they are and what they, wh how you need to pay them and operating expenses, and then we get back to the cash, and ultimately it is the cash. <coughs> the revenue projections are the most difficult piece of the puzzle. If you are a sole practitioner and you're out by yourself, you have to sit down and say, how many hours am I gonna work? How much am I gonna charge per hour that I'm gonna work? Am I gonna charge flat fees? Am I going to discount my services? So it is a difficult piece to prepare, and you, you have to sit down and think about what is your investment of your time and your business going to be. But in essence, revenue is the most important piece. If you can't generate the revenue, it doesn't matter what the expenses are, you're not going to cover them. So you have to work on understanding what the revenue components are and how you have fluctuation there. Here is an example of a revenue projection. And in this example, I have taken two partners, two associates, and two paralegals for sake of just the example. And what we have is um, you have your partner here, and you have your partners, your associates, your paralegals. You have a standard rate, again, what do you think you can charge your clients? How do you think it's going to work? So you come up with a standard rate, and then your billable hours goals. OK, I know I'm being aggressive here, so let's just put that on the table. But we can hope. We can hope that your associate, if you have one, is going to outwork you. Um, and then you take in your hours adjustments and your rate adjustments. Understand that no matter what you bill, what you work, you will not get paid for. You know, it's just not going to happen. It's not realistic. So there will always be an adjustment. Whether, whether you tell that client, that client calls and says, oh, you billed me 10 hours for this project. I only thought it was going to take five. OK, well, I'll bill you seven. There's always going to be that conversation, or there's always going to be that situation where you, at the end of the project, or the, when you're looking at a bill, you go, mm, I just can't bill that client that money. So you may adjust your hours. You may adjust the rate. So you have someone where you think, OK, my standard rate is $300 an hour. Well, you met with this guy. You liked him. You, you know he really can't afford it, so you're going to charge him $200 an hour. So this spreadsheet is pretty basic. It out, it's a, all driven by Excel. It's all driven you know, by formulas, so you can change components of that spreadsheet. You can change your expectations. When you're sitting down to try to forecast your revenue, you can say, OK, I don't want to work 1,800 hours. 
I only want to work 1,200 hours, but I want to work. I want to make this much revenue. Well, how much does that mean I have to charge on an hourly rate? What does it mean for you to know how much revenue you ultimately want to make? And then you can decide if that's a goal that you can live with. So that budget, in this budget, we have an hours adjustment, we have a rate adjustment, and then we have a realization adjustment. And realization is ultimately when you actually get paid the cash. Sometimes somebody will send you a check for, you send them a bill for $500 and they send you a check for $450. Okay, you're gonna take the $450, you're gonna follow up on the $50, whatever it may be. So then you have realization. And that ultimately gets you to your revenue projection. As a component of the revenue and the pro forma financial statements, you really need to understand the revenue cycle. And what this means for you is ultimately when you work it, it takes a long time to get to where you have the cash receipt for it. So you have a timekeeper or an, yourself doing the work, you enter your time in your software, you can get an hours report from it to see where you're at. You can look at the WIP and the value of it. Then it goes into a detailed billing report. Then it moves to, in this case, it's going to a billing partner. If that's you, you review it. You look at the bill. Then you ultimately create an invoice and send that invoice to the client. Then we wait and see how long it takes for the client to pay. You can run an AR report and look at your accounts receivable. Typically, in, for example, in corporate work, you're looking at, from the time you work something, 45 days while that work sits in what's called work in process. And that means you've worked the time and it's just sitting there waiting to be billed. Once it's billed, it's taking 95 days on average to collect that dollar, that bill. With litigation work, the process is even longer. It's usually 60 days in WIP and 128 days in AR. So when you think about that, that's if you work it today, you're not looking to get that money for about six months. So when you're doing your forecast and your financial statements to take to your to add to your business plan, you need to think about that and understand that what you work in the first month you start out in business, you're probably not gonna collect any of that for at least three to four months, and then you'll start seeing some of that trickle in. Your goal, industry standard goal, is 40 days in WIP and 75 days in AR. And I will tell you it's very hard to achieve, especially in today's market, to get to that level. Um, you're not, if you're a sole practitioner, you probably have a good chance of billing your WIP in 30 days to meet that 40 day goal, but otherwise, you're not gonna see it in the bigger law firms. When you start talking about expenses and you look at your startup's expenses, you need to think about the things that are gonna happen when you first wanna start your business up. What are those first time costs that you're looking at paying? You know, you have business, and re business registration fees, license fees, rent deposits, you know, going out and trying to lease space, you're not looking at just paying that rent for the month, it's like renting an apartment. They're gonna want security, they're gonna want money, especially from a sole practitioner. Um, down payment on equipment, you know, you might be able to go out and get a lease of, lot, of a lot of the equipment that you need initially, but you are gonna have to make deposits on those. So you're gonna need to plan for those startup expenses. Um, utility fees, whatever's covered, whatever you can think of, translate it from a personal perspective into a business, it's probably likely gonna carry over. Operating expenses, salaries. If you have a you know, sole practitioner, you can sit in an office and do everything yourself. Do you want, do you want a secretary? Do you need a paralegal? Who do, you, who do you need working with you? You need to think about those salaries and understand that you need to pay yourself as well as those, those people who work for you. Um, you have rent, insurance, telecommunications. In today's environment, telecommunications budget is a big number. It's not just getting a phone line. 
you need internet, you need access um, phones, you need service, and you need communication. Utilities, marketing. Daniel's gonna talk later about marketing. Marketing for a sole practitioner is a big number. How much money do you wanna spend to try to get your business going? Um, loan payments, you know, everybody's, not only do you have school loans, but you're gonna have loans for your business. Supplies, maintenance, just things you can think about on a regular basis. Here's a balance sheet. When you come to do a financial plan and you look at um, putting together those pro forma financial statements, you're gonna want to carry out your financial statements and they're gonna wanna see a balance sheet that goes to what you expect will happen with your business at the end of the year. Where do you think you're going to be? So, you know, balance sheet is assets. Um, you have your current assets and you have your fixed assets and then you have your current liabilities and your long-term liabilities and then your equity. And your equity is basically what you've invested in the business. So you, for those of you who don't have basic accounting, your equity number is assets minus, minus liabilities equals your equity in the business. So that example right there just is very basic, probably for a startup company. You're not going to have very much more than that on a balance sheet. And, you know, cash in the bank, petty cash, equipment, depreciation. Depreciation is one of those numbers that you have that's a non-cash number. So when you talk about getting back to your cash requirements, if you have a lot of assets and you depreciate them, then you have to take into account that you're gonna pay, you're not gonna pay tax on stuff that's depreciated. Okay. Here is a cash flow budget. And this is, think about this as your prediction. Again, you're gonna look at your revenue projection and take out what you think you're gonna make from a revenue perspective in your cash flow and sit down and go month by month so that you have everything laid out in a month. What do you expect, what do you expect your expenses to be on a monthly basis? Uh, what do you expect your revenue to be? And as you can see in this example, the first month I have no revenue. I'm being a little optimistic and saying, we're gonna get a little bit of revenue in the next month, hopefully. And then from then on, we may get some you know, regular consistent revenue coming in the door. And there's expenses listed here of the typical expenses you would see in a startup law firm. Um, you have various items by month and you have things that are periodic. Things like, for example, you're not gonna pay your accountant every month, so typically. Um, assuming you're doing your books, that's an example of expense that's not gonna happen every month. You're gonna have that expense periodically. So as you're looking to formulate your financial statements, you wanna identify those expenses that really will occur you know, every month religiously, something like rent, medical insurance, um, you know, supplies, things you need to control. And um, one of the things that is not on here, and I don't live by PowerPoint, is um, the trust accounting. And I wanna talk a little bit about that. And for all of you in this room, I know you probably have taken or are aware of your trust accounts, but it is vitally important that you understand trust accounting rules understand the importance of segregating your funds and keeping that money separate from your operating budget and your cash accounts. Lomas is sponsoring this. Lomas is a great resource of information as far as trust accounting goes. And if you have any questions, how you can do it. Um, the 
startup expenses, when you sit and you go through them, you know, you don't have to account for a trust account. You know, it's not part of the piece. And you just have to worry about setting up a bank account so that you have a bank account with Florida Bar compliance so that you follow all the IOTA regulations. And when we go back to startup expenses, we need to, you need to think about things like detailed information like technology needs, computers, fax machines. Um, what is it you want out of technology? Mail equipment. How are, you gonna, how are you gonna send out your mail? Maybe you're not gonna have any mail. Maybe you're gonna do everything electronic. Um, you know, what do you need? At the end of your business plan, you have a financial statement package. And what you wanna do with that is then create a summary to take to someone. So you want to take your financial statements, review them, and understand what it means, what you've put on paper. So you wanna take the opportunity to explain to the person you're meeting with and talking about your business with so that they know that you've really thought through this process. And you have, you create a little summary of saying, you know, I'm going to invest X number of dollars or my father-in-law is going to invest X number of dollars in my business. I plan to generate, you know, $1 million in revenue and I expect to have four staff and I will ultimately make a 35% profit. Take the opportunity to review your financial statements and understand them so that when you're having a conversation with the person about your potential business and how you wanna generate revenue, that you can take that summary and they can read it and understand and know that you've really thought through the process. Explain how you're gonna accomplish your goals. What is it you wanna do? How does your revenue play? You know, how did you get to the revenue number that you, ex you have on paper? Explain that you expect to work X number of hours a week. Um, you expect to have this hourly rate and generate the revenue. Um, if you have someone you're going into business with, sit down, have an understanding of what you want to do and work together on getting those numbers. It's important for you to understand how the revenue component works of the financial statements because that truly does drive all the other numbers. While your balance sheet reflects the assets and liabilities and what you have equity in in your company, the revenue number is key for you meeting to for you meeting the budget you've set for yourself. You can make adjustments to things in your expenses. You can probably make adjustments to your revenue if you're willing to work harder or you're willing to push or try to work with those staff that work with you. But there isn't a lot of room to work with revenue. And once you get a few clients, there isn't a lot of room for you to work with rates. I mean, it's very hard today in today's market to get a rate increase. You know, if you have, if you have you know, a family-owned grocery store and you're their lawyer and you charge them you know, $200 an hour and you've charged it for the last three or four years, it's gonna be really hard to go out and get a rate increase. But you need to think about how you can impact your financial statements by a component of both the revenue and the expenses. You know, we, we've all heard about the, you know, law firms that have laid numerous people off and in the last few years trying to cut expenses, trying to look at the bottom line. It's important for you to understand what goes in your pro forma um, revenue and income statement so that you're planning and preparing for those numbers. Marketing is a big, big number for those people who are on their own and younger. It's, it's definitely an investment where you need to 
um, look at those numbers and understand the components. You need to understand uh, what what goes on an in, what goes on a balance sheet, and understand that your assets are key. In a small operation, you're probably not going to have that many. You're going to have the cash in the bank, and you're going to have your equipment and some small fixed assets that you've purchased. But other than that, it's probably not going to be a lot. You know, even in a business our size, we may have a lot of bank accounts, but basically it's a bank account. Um, the expenses, I mean the liabilities, that's where depending on what you're doing and how you're, you've structured your business, you could have long-term loans, you could you know, have an, a large accounts payable depending on how fa far out you want to pay your bills and what your expectation is on getting things done. And if you have a personal loan, if you're gonna put it into the business and pay it from there. Um, remember that assets are tangible objects of financial value that are owned by the company. And liabilities are debt that is owed to a creditor by the company. Remember that your budget is a prediction and it can be affected by numerous things. It can be affected by the economy, labor market, it can be affected by changes in the industry, changes in technology, disasters, and so many things out of your control. So when you're looking at that budget, it's really important to understand it is just a budget. It's important for you to look at it each month and identify, compare what actually happened that month to what you had on paper for the budget. One of the things I didn't show is a variance, a budget to variance. And that allows you to take those numbers and put down your budget on paper for each month, put down your actual expenses, and do some subtraction. Learn, were you off on revenue? Were you off on um, you know, supplies? Did you have a large case that month that you had to go out and buy a ton of supplies for? that you aren't prepared for. Look at it and understand you need to compare those numbers on a monthly basis. Don't just assume that you, know, you get down six months down the road into this process and you look at your numbers and go, oh my gosh, medical insurance is twice what I budgeted for. You need to know that right away. You need to understand what's happening. Um, one of the business, at the end of your financial statements and your business plan if you're taking it in, I'm going to give you just a really brief example. Um, you know, law firm will have startup cost of equipment and office space for which, which I will invest personal funds of X. The initial startup cost will cost $20,000 in leasehold improvements and rent space and for rental space and $25,000 for two new copiers, workstations, fax machine. And variable cost will include, you know, toner, paper, copier, repairs and maintenance, sales and marketing expenses. We just go on and on to talk about what we envision in that thing in the marketing plan. The the law firm will generate X dollars in revenue the first year in operation with an estimated gross profit. And based on these assumptions, we envision this loan to be paid off in X number of years. Things like that will help your business plan so that they understand that you've really thought the process through and that you really understand the numbers, the economics, and your workflow. One of the key pieces to this whole process is how are you going to keep your books? What are you going to use? What tools? And there are a lot of them out there. One of the easiest things that I can suggest, quite honestly, is QuickBooks. And QuickBooks is very reasonable in cost. It's easy to use. 
It has all facets of a business you could want. It allows you to invoice, take in deposits, pay bills, and their software comes with an extensive amount of help. They have online tutorials as well as support from the company itself. So one of the things that QuickBooks allows you to do is really key in those numbers. You can keep track of your time. You can create expenses. Once you set up your chart of accounts and you understand um, some of these items that I showed you earlier, things like rent and medical insurance and office supplies, you can key these in and they'll have a chart of accounts there for you. And when you cut a check, you just charge where it goes. It will automatically create those financial statements for you. So it's truly a key to having a good set of books is to have software to do that. And you need to understand how you can use it to your benefit. There are so many different ways you can transition the software. You can customize reports, you can um, get out AR, you can run a balance sheet, you can run an income statement within a few clicks. It's very easy to use. Um, one of the handouts that I gave everybody that I'm not going over is some key definitions and it talks about some of the items that I've mentioned here. If you want to read that, I'm not going to read that. And there's also a list of resources on there. So if you want more information about how to start up a, a law firm, how to get that information, you can. One of the great resources is a book by Mr. Quinn. It talks about law firm accounting. It goes into a lot of detail. There's also some additional reference material there. Um, and one of the great pieces of resource knowledge that I have gained throughout my years of experience has been at the Association of Legal Administrators website. And that's also listed there. And they are more than happy to provide information. They have a full library of resource materials. And if anybody is interested, I would be happy to email them my Excel files, and I'll be happy to share those with you. So if you are, just let me know. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Dan Perry. I'm an attorney in Orlando. Uh, I want you to know that I've heard a similar presentation probably half a dozen times in my career. I've been a lawyer for 28 years. And at least I think that's one of the better presentations I've heard on how to do all of that in a relatively painless manner. Thank you. Thank you. The materials that she brought are very good. Make sure you get those before you leave. The materials that I provided are only two pages in length. <laughs> Um, I was asked to speak on the subject of business planning or business plans and planning. And I, I want to tell you first off that it, it's my opinion and there are a number of other individuals, if you Google the question, what should I do about a business plan, where they will actually tell you that business plans are passé and out of date and useless but that planning is absolutely crucial. And so when you're doing a uh, startup law practice, planning is so important that I am tickled to be able to share a little bit of what I've learned um, in planning my law practice. As I sit here, first off, I'm 53 years of age. Uh, I'd love for, to be able to say to you that I've had a stellar law practice and everything has gone beautiful. Um, I will tell you that my law practice has gone in fits and jerks. Um, I think I have succeeded in spite of myself. And let me share a little bit of that with you. Uh, first, when I was in my second year of law school in Orlando, I was actually at Wake Forest in uh, North Carolina. 
I got a, uh, a clerkship with a large law firm in Orlando, a substantial law firm that had an international practice in the area of products liability. And I worked with every partner in the law firm except one, the hiring partner. In retrospect, that was probably a stupid thing for me to omit, okay? Um, you know, good rule of thumb is if you want to get hired by a law firm, to work with the hiring partner and at least get to know him or her uh, on a first name basis. The senior partner made me an offer of full-time employment about seven weeks into my clerkship. And I knew that it was a substantial salary. And so to say that I was tickled would be a, an understatement. I excitedly called my law school career counselor and said, I just got an offer of employment. I was the first one in my graduating class to get an offer of full-time employment. Now I had, as a result of that offer, changed a lot of plans I made. I was considering going to tax school at University of Florida. I was on the waiting list and was optimistic that I would actually get in. I'd actually applied with a bunch of other firms and some of them were interested in me. But I called everybody and said, I'm working with this firm in Orlando. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Now that was in the fall of my third year. I got the, the knowledge and the information that I was going to be employed. The following January, still in my third year, I got a call from the hiring partner with apologies. Hey, we're real sorry we have to withdraw your offer of employment, which stunned me. It was, I've never even heard of that happening. We have to withdraw your offer of employment because we just got hired by this large international company and we've had to hire seven new lawyers. And so we don't know that there'll be room for you, but go ahead and send us your resume when you actually graduate and we'll be glad to talk to you then. And I will tell you that it crushed me at first, and then I got angry about it. Um, after I said a few expletive deleteds about these lawyers, the way they had treated me, I came to the realization that I was going to have to open my own firm. Because that, by that time, we're talking January, February of my third year, all the firms had already hired everybody, or they'd already sent communication that they were hiring people. For me to start interviewing at that point in time was like impossible. So I, uh, I opened my own practice. Um, I want you to know that I should have done everything that Lisa told you to do. I did none of those things. Um, I basically called my local banker and asked to take him to lunch. And I explained what happened and I said, you know, I'm angry about what happened, but I am going to be a success, so I want you to take a chance on me. And the guy basically said, how much do you want? So I told him how much I wanted in the way of an operating credit line. And he said, I think we can do that. Not a problem. No business plan, no uh, resume, no estimation of revenue. Frankly, I didn't even have an ad in the yellow pages. Okay? And so for the first six months, I put my shingle out, and I sat at my desk, and I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And I will tell you that eventually word got out and every mentally unstable individual in Orlando came through my door to want to hire me to sue the FBI and everybody else you can possibly imagine. This one lady in particular came in and she was very well dressed, obviously looked like she had some money. And she came in and she goes, Mr. Perry, I need you to help me sue the FBI. And I go, well, okay. What do you need done and why? And she said, well, because every time I go outside the FBI agents jump out of trash cans or alleyways and they shoot a ray gun at my rear end and it knocks me unconscious. And I went, uh-huh, okay, and how long has this been happening? It's been happening for years and I need somebody who's got some guts who can sue the FBI and stop them from doing this. Now I have to tell you, in retrospect I wasn't altogether, I was polite to her. But I wasn't particularly nice to her because what I did was I immediately went to my Rolodex and tried to find somebody else I could send her to. And I sent her to another attorney and I thought it was real funny. Um, in retrospect, I regret doing that, okay? But my point is, is that I realized after about six months that if I continued to keep my practice open, I was gonna starve, all right? So I said, well, what is it I really want out of life? What do, what do I want? Well, I wanna be a litigator. So I marched into the state attorney's office and I said, okay, here's the deal. I want to litigate. And I figured the best place to get litigation experience is the state attorney's office. And I want jury trial experience. And they said, well, unfortunately, the only opening we have is in juvenile and you won't get jury trial experience. So I went, 
see ya. And I went to the public defender's office. I walked in. I said, I want trial experience with juries. What can you do for me? And they said, well, Dan, tell you what. We'd love to have you. And if you can convince your clients to go to trial, you can have all the jury trial experience you want. And I went, yes. So I went in with the public defender's office. My starting salary was, as I recall, $17,500. Now, this was in, um, well, it was 28 years ago, 1984. No, that's not right. Anyway, the, the point is, is that I started out with probably a salary that was one-fifth of what I was going to start out with with this products liability firm. And I will tell you, it's my belief that that was one of the best decisions of my life because I learned something about myself. I'd always deemed myself to be conservative. In fact, my first instinct was to go to the state attorney's office. I, I want to prosecute these criminals who are taking advantage of citizens. And I said, you know, I'll try being a public defender. And to say that the public defender junior administrators had fun with, had fun with me would be an understatement. My very first client that they sent in was a male prostitute who, when he shook my hand, I noticed that he had a light green fungus across his forearm. And he was accused of engaging in a sex act in a public restroom. Now, you know, I was even cleaner cut then than I am now. And so I'm listening to this and I'm going, oh my God, what did this guy do? And I'm writing all this down and I went, okay, let's just relax. I got to talk to him a little bit, give him some advice about what he can do to defend on the charges, et cetera. And when I went out into the office, there were half a dozen administrators there smirking at me, going, well, you still want this job? And I went, yeah, no problem. I didn't tell him at the time that I was beat red with embarrassment having hear, heard what this guy had to say. But I realized that I, I actually enjoyed the practice, OK? And I enjoyed helping people, yes, even a male prostitute with a light green fungus on his arm. So they, um, the very first day of my formal practice as a public defender, they gave me these two huge briefcases to take over to court and dropped me in a trial uh, department which had about 350 active clients. And there were at least 100 that were there that day. So picture me, uh, I'm walking up the stairs. I get to the top of the stairs, and I trip. And I fall forward on my face, both briefcase satchels fly open, and all of those hundred files, like a deck of cards down the hallway, just go right down the hall. And all of my clients are sitting in the hallway watching. And one of them turns to the other and goes, oh my god, that's our damn lawyer. OK? Now, I nevertheless continued on. And I, uh, I have to tell you, I, I I made some decisions early on in my career that, that I said, you know, I'm just not going to stand by and watch somebody get beat up on, whether or not they're my client. And I've actually been walking through the courthouse. It was the first week of my practice. And there was this woman bawling her eyes out um, at the court clerk's office with everybody else just walking by. And so I went over and said, ma'am, is there a problem? Can we help you with anything? She's not my client, you know, but I'm you got to help this person. It later turned out that she was a bipolar individual that was off her medication. She'd had a manic episode and was arrested in the consequence of a domestic violence case. And she later became a client. I helped her with her case. And she has now, for the past almost 30 years, been a close friend of mine. Okay? So my point in telling you those stories, because frankly, I know you don't want to hear a bunch of stories. Uh, my point in telling you that is that don't ever look a gift horse in the mouth. Because there are times that you will learn things from what you're doing right now that will affect and color the rest of your life for the better. It's possible it could affect it worse, but I always like to be optimistic. I want to talk marketing for you. Planning in this economy is so important that it's not even funny. Two months ago in Orlando, a, um, a life coach, if you will, and he called himself a law practice management coach, advertised a CLE seminar called uh, When Worlds Collide. 
And he invited all the lawyers to come in and talk about what was happening in the economy, legal zoom, all the other things you're hearing about where lawyers are, are closing practices. They're finding themselves, their practices outsourced to India and places like that. And he said, I want to come and I want to share with you what's going on in this economy. And he spent almost an hour basically terrifying these lawyers about what was going on in the economy. His sales pitch was, hire me as a coach to help you. Now, I went to that, not because I was scared of the economy, because frankly, I'm not as scared of the economy as a lot of people are. I'll tell you why in a moment. But I went to that because I wanted to see who would show up. Now, you would have guessed that it would have been younger lawyers, potentially, because they're interested in trying to avoid pitfalls. I will tell you that the population of the room, there must have been 150 lawyers in attendance. There were a lot of older lawyers. And ladies and gentlemen, the fear in that room was palpable. More importantly, it was palpable before he even started. Okay? People are looking at each other going, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And we have to lay off five associates this past month. I've been to bar luncheons where uh, lawyers, where you've got 10, 12 lawyers in a circle. Of the 12 lawyers, at least half have received a pink slip or possibly expecting a pink slip. And a few others have resigned because the possibility of partnership is non-existent now in most large law firms. So to say that the market has gone sour for young lawyers would be an obvious statement. Now, congratulations though. This actually is the best time, in my opinion, for a young lawyer to go into solo practice. Here's why. First, the older lawyers are simply terrified. They're like deer in the headlights about the internet, okay? They do not comprehend social media. I mean, if you may even say the word Facebook to them, their lower lip quivers a little bit, okay? And they don't understand how you can think about a mobile phone in a different context than they do. I mean, remember when they grew up, they had phone numbers for home and office. And so a phone number was for a place, okay? Now we've reached the point where a phone number is for a person, okay? And so for them, they, they can't even get around that idea. They go, well, uh, I'm gonna call my home. No, not anymore, because my wife's got a cell phone, I need to call my wife, you know? And you can almost see the gears in their head having trouble meshing because they don't comprehend. Now, I have a Twitter feed, I have a Facebook page, I have a website. Um, just the fact that I have that is unusual for an attorney. More importantly, I don't hit people with the sales pitch every waking moment. And whenever you see ads on television or you see ads sponsored by law firm, blah, 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 um, I can't imagine the money that's being wasted. So let me share with you a couple observations about what you can do to use your time and money more efficiently. A good rule of thumb, and I've learned this over 30 years, is that when everybody else is zigging, you should zag, okay? I know that sounds easy to say it, but it's absolutely true. For example, a lot of lawyers use document assembly software now to create forms that you can file in a court file, okay? I actually go to the opposite extreme. I make a special effort to custom all, customize all of my pleadings. I've had plenty of judges that have complimented me on my pleadings. One judge just flat said, I'm calling Mr. Perry today because I enjoyed reading his motion more than anybody else's, okay? So I can assure you, if you, if you zag when other people are zigging, you will stand out. The other thing that you should do is in your life and in your career, you should say to yourself, I am the only lawyer in the world that fill in the blank. Now, that's really ambitious, okay? One of my favorite things to do at a legal seminar is to ask lawyers how they market themselves. And if you ask them, you go around the room and say, hey, how do you guys market yourself? Oh, we do this and we do that and we do this and we do that. And I go, and what do you say in those marketing brochures? Well, we say that we're a good lawyer. And, and you go around the room and everybody's saying the same darn thing, okay? Well, what happens is, no matter how beautiful your website is, how beautiful your social media is, if you're saying the same thing, you become white noise, all right? 
I saw an ad recently, and, and while I didn't necessarily like what I saw, um, it, it certainly stood out in my mind, which is a law firm that says, we only represent men. That's it. We don't represent women at all, okay? I used, I, now, I used to represent women in divorce cases, and I can tell you that on balance, I'd rather represent a woman in a divorce case than a man. Why? Because men get their emotions in these kind of situations way out of whack. They do have more money, but they're much harder clients to deal with generally. But my point is, is that if you're trying to reach a target market, to say that you have a family law practice that only caters to men certainly helps you reach those individuals that you're looking for, okay? Your vocabulary can be very narrow. In fact, all you have to do is just nod your head and go, how could she do that to you, okay? And you've got the client in your hand, okay? A better approach would be to say, our law firm only represents men who happen to be bankers, okay? Or our law firm only represents male bankers. Or our law firm only represents male bankers who like to play golf, okay? Because then that's a very narrow niche that you could cater to. Now, if you're a banker who likes to play golf and you're looking for a divorce lawyer, who are you going to go see? You're going to go see that lawyer that resonates with how you feel. Now, you could take it to its most logical extreme and say, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know where I want to go. I don't know what my practice is going to be. I just know what I'm doing right now. I promise you, if you spend, in my case, 10 plus years thinking about it, if you spend 10, 20 hours right now thinking about what makes you stand out from all the other lawyers and start trying to craft your message, whatever that may be, today, on the web, on social media, on mobile platforms, whatever it may be, if you craft your message today, you'll be in a lot better shape 20 years from now. Now, let's talk about um, a book that was published in 2008 by Professor Richard Suskind. Turns out that um, Melissa, and by the way, where's Melissa? Melissa, thanks again uh, to Legal Corps for inviting me. I apologize I didn't thank you earlier. I noticed that in your Legal Corps Twitter stream, they actually follow Richard Suskind, okay? Um, I've spoken to, Mr. to Professor Suskind. I've got all his books. I've got um, bookmarks for every lecture he's ever given. If you pay attention to anybody on this planet about the future of law, he's probably one of the ones you should pay attention to. He basically says, okay, the future's here, whether you like it or not, the law practice is like newspapers and the music industry on the verge of being dismantled, okay? It's gonna be replaced by outsourcing, it's gonna be replaced by um, commodity practices, it's gonna be replaced by um, people servicing with different business models than they are now and get over it because it's here. I will tell you that not only is he right, but I actually embrace what he says. Here's why. You should not fear LegalZoom. You should not fear the changes in the practice of law because you all are uniquely positioned to take advantage of it. All you have to do is change a little bit of your thought process, okay? You're gonna hear, if you read Richard Suskind's book and if you follow him on the internet, you're gonna hear of the concept of freemium, F-R-R-M-I-U-M, freemium. Um, you would be shocked at how much time I give to clients for free. I give, on average, two to three days a week, two to three days a week free to clients. In fact, my, my income over the years has gone progressively up, and as I donate more time free to clients, it's gone even higher than my wife the other day said, you know, I've been noticing your income over the years. I said, she said, as you start giving away more free time and free advice, your income actually is increasing. Don't you think you might want to give some more free advice? And I went, yes. The more I can give, the better. Here's how you make money off of it. And this is after 30 years of being a techie lawyer, 30 years of being a litigator, um, four years of being a county judge, um, representing homeowners and homeowner associations all over the state of Florida. I mean, literally doing just about every kind of practice you can imagine. Here's why I give away free advice. 
I render the competition irrelevant. Because if I know that I want to uh, be retained by a condominium association, there's lots of condos in Orlando, for example, if I know that I want to be retained by a condo association, I'm not going to start out quoting them a fee. I'm going to start out saying, what can I do to help you? Because once they realize that I can offer them some value, the next thing they're going to say is, Mr. Perry, we'd like to talk to you about a retainer program about hiring you to represent us. And I go, let's not do that just yet until I fully understand what your problems are and what your practice requires. And it might necessitate a meeting with the board of directors. I've actually sat down with the board of directors at condos and homeowner associations, and I've said the best value I can bring to the table is for me to eventually educate you so much so that you no longer need me. Now, imagine if you're a client and the lawyer says, I want to do such a good job for you that you eventually won't even need me. Who are you going to hire? You're going to hire this guy because this guy has a target in mind to eventually make sure that he does such a good job for you that you don't need him anymore. So I've actually turned around and quoted retainer fee programs for these clients that are stratospheric, really high. And I've never had somebody turn me down. Never. Here's an example. There's a homeowner association in Lakeland, Florida. Their past five lawyers charged them $250 an hour, which in my book is insane for that kind of practice. That's way too high. Senior citizens don't want to pay $250 an hour for any lawyer. Okay? So what I did came in and I said, well, I don't want to charge you an hourly rate. Let me help you with your problems. And I did. I helped them with some problems. I won't give you the details. But I put about 20 hours of work into their practice, into their issues. And I realized how much work it was going to entail over a long term. And I quoted them in a retainer program that was five times as high as the past three lawyers. So in one year, they were going to pay me five times what they paid the last three lawyers. Okay? And it took their breath away until they realized no lawyer knew them better. No lawyer was more generous with his time. And I actually developed systems for them that helped them stay out of trouble. So I will tell you that they have been retainer clients of mine and have gladly renewed their retainer program for now. This is the third year. All right? Less clients, more income. It just makes sense. And frankly, you're at the stage in your career when you can give your time to get the experience. So do things like write a blog, do social media, do a Facebook page about what you're interested in. Start getting yourself out there. If you haven't already done it, you should do it now. And by the way, I get probably about 50 resumes a month from people. Nine times out of 10, the resume starts off, Dear Attorney, or the cover letter says, Dear Attorney. All right? They didn't even bother to personalize the resume. All right? You think I'm even going to read past the first sentence when somebody doesn't bother to personalize a letter to you? It goes right into the trash. But I will tell you that other lawyers get lots of resumes. I personally think that a resume is overblown as a marketing device for a young lawyer. I think you're better off, if I were in your shoes, finding out if the lawyer's got a Twitter feed, and if so, follow it. Find out if the lawyer's got a Facebook page, personally, not just his firm, and if so, like it. Find out if the lawyer has a website, and if so, personally, particularly if he's written articles or she's written articles on the website, comment on his uh, Facebook, or sorry, his blog site, more than just simply, hey, this was really interesting, okay? I mean, actually bother to do some time and energy into researching something and saying, you know, Mr. Perry, I appreciate your insight on this issue. Um, I'm concerned, what does Jones versus Smith say about this question, okay? So you start a relationship with the person and then send them a resume after you've been following them for two to three months. And the reason for that is because then when you walk in the door, you already have a relationship. It's much easier to get the attention of somebody if you do that. Try and find out what the lawyer likes. Because frankly, it'll tell you a lot about whether or not you want to work for that lawyer. Susskind says, commodification is here. When you hear of attorneys saying that they're going to drop their hourly fee or they're going to spend $100,000 on television advertising, do not disabuse them of their 
marketing efforts, they won't appreciate it. Don't tell them, oh, do that. Okay, I've tried. I've had friends of mine, one guy sold his Porsche and put it all into TV ads to try and get personal injury cases. He didn't get one case from, personal in, from a television ad for personal injury. If people want to waste their money, don't try and disabuse them of that. I have a notation here that there are three critical startup skills that you must develop. The first is to curate information. Become a specialist in some aspect of your career. Let me use a quick example. The federal public defender in Orlando is a trans transplant from, I believe it's Utah. Her name slips me, but what she did was she came to a bar luncheon in Orlando and she began to talk to us about something that she has been passionate over her life, and that is that prosecutors will frequently vouch for their witness, okay? When you, when you have a prosecutor, some of you have already actually been in front of a jury, so you know what I'm probably talking about. When you have a prosecutor, sometimes they will say, Your Honor, the state calls Witness Jones. And they keep referencing how Witness Jones is here telling the truth under oath, blah, 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 blah. And they will say things which might vouch for that witness's credibility. As a lawyer, I can tell you, as a criminal defense lawyer for 20 years or so, I've always felt that prosecutors were picking my pocket by vouching for a witness. And I didn't really have the skills or tools, I admit it, to try and effectively object to that other than just say, Your Honor, objection, vouching. Okay? And sometimes you don't have a case law handy, it's difficult. So she came to the bar luncheon, and she, her topic of speech was improper vouching of witnesses. And she proceeded to go into great detail, I am writing like mad. And the pe person sitting next to me is like, what are you doing? And I went, man, don't you realize what she's doing here? She's giving us the fruit of all of her experience and research all this stuff. Oh my God. And I wrote all this stuff down. I must have written eight or nine pages. And I'm like, hey, 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 can you slow down just a little bit? I'm trying to get all this down. She didn't tell me she'd written a book, all right? Afterwards, when I went up to talk to her and ask her about something, she went, well, you might find it in my book. And I went, why didn't you tell us that you wrote a book? And he said, well, I didn't want to be too self-promotional. I went, oh, for God's sakes, I burn out three pens here trying to write down what you're telling me, and, I, and you have a book. Certainly, if you go to the ABA, there's a book on improper vouching by prosecutors. Now, that is a really narrow niche. But my point is, is that right now, you have the time and energy to actually focus. You can actually say, what is it I enjoy? I'm going to research this area. For just the amount of time it takes for me to be on the web, I'm going to become the go-to expert in this, whatever that is. Had she done that, and today, by the way, I wouldn't have written a book. I would have put a website up, and I would have updated it constantly. But she could have gone on to charge a membership fee to lawyers who want advice on how to handle improper vouching. I'd pay for it. Would I pay $7 a month? You betcha. Okay? to have access to an expert on improper vouching, because then I could be sitting in the courtroom on my mobile or on my laptop and actually searching you know, at a recess, Your Honor, I'd like to object because of X, Y, and Z. Now, Robert Scoble used to work for Microsoft. I met him when he was at some of the tech conferences. And Robert Scoble, if you go to the website, which is listed on my, on my form, you'll see what he does in curation. He started, he turned a video camera on the companies in Microsoft, the departments in Microsoft, just so that he could capture what they were doing. And he went around Microsoft and he'd met like 200 videos, and everybody thought it was painful, but the tech users loved it. And so he became a rock star at tech conferences because people were like, can you believe this guy is at Microsoft and he's very transparent, he really knows what he's doing, he knows right, how to ask the right questions, he make good interviews. And what happened, long story short, is he became so successful at his video program that companies begged him, come on and do a, a program for us and we will pay you for it. And he now sponsors tech conferences. He does all kinds of really fascinating things. He is a great model for you to follow because he's taken his speciality, which is tech curation, and turned it into an art. Seth Godin, uh, in my outline, talks about how to rethink a business plan, what you should do about marketing. Steve Jobs, I have in here, be a tweaker, the real genius of Steve Jobs. There's a notation to a New York Times article that talks about where Steve Jobs really succeeded was that he tweaked things. He didn't invent a mobile phone, but he saw a way to do it better. 
Steve Jobs didn't even invent a tablet device, but he saw a way to do it better. And when you really go back in time and you look on YouTube for Steve Jobs interviews, he freely admits that he stole most of his information and design work from Xerox Park. And he openly says, if Xerox had seen what I saw in what they were doing, they could have owned the computer market. But they didn't. They were a photocopier company, and they didn't think straight. He goes, I saw what they were doing with the GUI interface and realized that was the future of computing. You're at that stage where you can do that now as well. There are some additional resources on uh, the two-page document that I gave you guys. Feel free, of course, to go uh, to look at Lomas's resource. Lomas, by the way, has wonderful resources. Many of them are free. The ones that aren't free are very low cost. The other thing is, and this is not a sales pitch because I'm, I'm not trying to charge you anything or earn any money off of you, but if you want to reach me and get some more information about marketing your practice, and I will have a couple minutes, I think, for questions, won't we? Okay. If you want to reach me, all you have to do is text going solo to 99158. Again, going solo to 99158. Um, that's the best way to reach me because it puts you on a newsletter list that I send out people uh, giving solo practice updates and information. I'm on the executive council with the general practice and solo small firm section, and we try and keep people informed, and we invite you to participate in that conversation. Are there any questions? Last chance. Okay. All right. Then I want to um, I want to first um, urge you to continue pursuing marketing. Um, frankly, I had somebody say to me that lawyers should think about marketing 20 to 30% of the time. I think about marketing 80% of the time. Everything you do should be focused on making yourself look better, okay, to the world. By the way, sometimes I'm asked the question, well, what about stationery and business cards? I will tell you that I quit using business cards years ago because you, we know all know where they're going to go. They're going to go right in the trash or they're going to go in a drawer somewhere. It's no big deal. Stationary is an odd one because I struggled with a logo for years. You know, a logo, I had to have the type just right. I burned so many hours worrying about my stationary that I finally just gave up and I started using almost all electronics. Uh, I started for the occasional printed document. I used just an ordinary letterhead, you know, nothing special. I even change it uh, on a whim if I want to. And, you know, I've never had somebody say to me, you don't have letterhead? I've never had that happen, okay? So when we're talking about opening a practice, I, I want to be clear here. I am a big advocate of open as inexpensively as you can. All right? I mean, in fact, frankly, when I opened my practice, I think I had maybe $1,000 in the bank when I opened my practice. Okay? And I then went with the public defender's office, and when I opened my practice again, I had maybe $10,000 in the bank because I'd saved it up or whatever. But it was very modest. You know, I open a small firm. I had a part-time secretary that I shared with other lawyers. It just worked. So when you, hopefully, you will get to that day when you will work with people like Lisa and her firm where you can bill $350 an hour to people. Hopefully, you'll get there. But I've never been able to get there. That, that path was never open to me. Uh, I had to do it on my own, and I did it as inexpensively as I can. So please... Keep in mind, there are lots of solos out there that are working out of their home, that are doing it inexpensively. In fact, in the most recent continuing legal education seminar that we put on for the Florida Bar, we had seven panelists. All seven had been operating out of their home, primarily, and one lawyer had a, a standard office because a university basically gave it to him for free. Okay? So a lot of the lawyers, particularly solo practitioners, they are operating on the, um, on the thin edge which means you can beat them if you get out there and you move. Okay? Question? Marcus? Yeah, regarding uh, Facebook and Twitter, how does that work with the rules? You mean in terms on ethics? Yes. Very simply. Um, the question, let me repeat it, was how do you work social media with uh, the realization that you have ethical guidelines you have to follow? I make a point in the social media that I do to never start with a sales pitch. Never, okay? So I personally think that you, the public sees a sales pitch from a lawyer and immediately discounts it and you. So what I tend to do is I go, how can I be generous in what I see and hear and what I read? So for example, if I'm doing a Twitter stream 
and I see some interesting piece of information in the news, and I think it might be interesting to the people that will follow me, I don't say, see the article in the New York Times, by the way, don't forget to hire me. I don't do that, okay? I just go, wow, really cool article in the New York Times about X, Y, and Z. Uh, see my blog for further discussion. Now, do not make the mistake. Some law firms think that their blog is a sales piece, and so they will do this pretty extensive discussion about the latest case. I don't know why clients are interested in cases. Frankly, I don't think they are. But the latest case and blah, 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 at the bottom it says, if you have further need for a lawyer in the area of this practice, please contact us. I would drop that stuff, okay? I would, I would absolutely bend over backwards to not engage in a sales pitch. Got why is that? Because the best sales pitch is no sales pitch at all. Okay? Trust me, people, if they need a lawyer's help, know you practice law and they know where they can reach you. They can email you, they can call you, whatever. Okay? But get away from the idea that you have to always interrupt people, that you have to use social media. Um, for goodness sakes, be generous with your time, be generous with your advice. You know, and by the way, starting a blog, boy, I wish I had started a blog when I was in practice. I mean, the very first time. Of course, at that time, it was very difficult to do when I started, 1984, okay? But in 1994, blogging was completely open. I could have done a very aggressive blog, and I would have had 10 plus years experience doing it. I would have been a world's expert in whatever area I chose. I did not follow through on that marketing advice. I hope you learned from my lesson, okay? Any other questions? Thank you very much, and I'll stick around if you have any further questions.